morning, everybody. It's November 19th, 2021. I'm Charlie Clint with Ted Shilowitz. It's This Week in XR. If you are listening, as most of you do, Ted and I are wearing our N-Real smart glasses. And to add to the fun, to add to the fun today, we've got uh, one of our favorite people, Blake Harris. He's the author of the book on Facebook, History of the Future, as well as Console Wars, two books that uh, I know we love and talk about all the time. And Ted, I have to say, you look great in your white and real smart glasses. We can go back to our Billy Crystal days. You look marvelous, darling. <laughs> <laughs> we figured we'd start the show by uh, talking about uh, sort of practicing what we preach, that we actually, you know, test these devices, live in these devices, try and figure out where the value points of these devices are. And, uh, you know, we've been tracking this one for a number of years now, and they're starting to come out in the U.S. market, which is well, exciting. Well, when they announced them from the stage at AWE in 2019, uh, for 2020, by the way, yeah, everybody yeah. went crazy. Yeah, I mean, it was like the greatest thing that ever happened at AWE. <laughs> That's how desperate we are. Right. And, uh, and uh, they're good. They are good. Yes. Um, it's a very first adopter thing. Nobody has the right kind of 5G smartphone. Um, the new yeah, and I go back just, you know, for, for the, for I know most people are listening to this, not watching it, but if you want to pop onto the YouTube link and watch, I go back a number of generations. These are the original um, ODG smart classes, which oh you'll notice sort of look uh, yeah. very similar. Um, early, early stage didn't get to the uh, the commercial success of this, but you know through the evolution of all these. We have friends from General Magic, uh, the the woman that did the documentary, and there's that stage of those that got it largely right, but couldn't cross the threshold, right? And now we're going to watch if Enreal can cross the threshold, which is really interesting. Um, yeah, as for a 5G uh, see-through smartphone, I mean, there's nothing else. I mean, it's, it's awesome. So uh, in other news, if I'm not fooling with this thing this weekend, uh, I'm going to be playing Golf Plus yes. on Oculus Quest. Yes. It's from the ProPut God guys. Uh -huh. And ProPut, it's a little like mini golf, but it's one of the best games on the Quest, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. non non shooter games and it's competitive right. and multiplayer and oftentimes just as frustrating as real golf uh, and what and i loved about the the pro prut and the, the top golf stuff is you know as you and i talk we're, we're both you know bad uh, golfers that want to be professional golfers in our in our real lives um they when they added the driving range um which is very much like yeah, they, top added golf, the top, the they added the virtual top golf Yes, and I love that. I, I really enjoy just getting in there, putting the, the quest on and essentially kind of, you know, simulating what I would do on the driving range. It's, and now they've taken it a step further. And unlike real golf, it doesn't take six hours. Right, it doesn't take six hours. And you can definitely hit a 300 yard drive if you <laughs> watch it. <laughs> oh, it, it is so much fun. So congratulations um, to Ryan and those guys. Uh, Great job, I think. And, you know, it's got, as a business, it's got recurring revenue because, you know, just like you want to upgrade the music pack right. uh, on Beat Saber, you can upgrade the courses. You know, they've got to deal with the PGA. You can upgrade the courses. So, uh, you know, I got to yeah, buy yeah, Pebble. Sure. For, I got to buy Pebble for $18. I just have to have it. <laughs> you right. know, they're really, I think, um, I think they're really on their way to building something really special. So uh, it's been fun to follow uh, their adventures and you know they're golfers and they're amateur golfers so right. I, I think they have a really keen sense of what the average person is going to do with this yeah I think it's a really important part of the of the VR story is enthusiasts that do something in the real world and love it regardless of how good or bad they are at it if they can find the right simulation path to right. create that goal set that is truly kind of the promise of VR and, right and, you Talk know about, the simulation could bring a lot of people to golf. Sure, yeah. So I mean, well, like I we think, talked about the health and wellness space, right? And with our friends at Supernatural, that's right. They got their big bump to be get uh, picked up by uh, by Facebook, which is yeah. Meta now, that was, which is that great. Was the uh, Within's uh, Hail Mary pass mm -hmm. uh, because 360 was quickly fading in the distance, and there was no real money in AR. So. You know, if that thing succeeded as it has, I mean, they get bought by Facebook. If it turns out that people get too sweaty wearing their Quest headset, as I do, they miss. But they right. hit the target and won the Super Bowl. Yeah. I mean, congrats I to Chris. Look, that's a, you know, he, he was one of the first people in the category. 
Right. And uh, it's great to see that he was finally got the reward he was looking Absolutely. for. We're, we're, we're thrilled to see that success. And, and, you know, it just goes to show you when you watch a market at large and you see something like, the success of Peloton, which brings some degree of simulation. And then they say, let's just take that one step further, use the VR headset and build a Peloton-like experience with real coaches and real workouts. And they link to a, a, a music system that actually allows them to license music, you know, popular music from all genres from all over the world. So people really enjoy it. Lo and behold, you have a hit. And lo and behold, the largest company, and I'm, no, I'm sure we're going to talk about uh, Qualcomm revealing how many... Yeah. Uh, Yes, Absolutely. well, we can segue right into that. <laughs> you know, Facebook does not break out the numbers uh, for Quest sales. So Qualcomm in an investor meeting said, oh, well, we know we sold 10 million chips to them. Right, right, right. So that was that. Uh, and of course, there are also Quest 1s, mm -hmm. of which I think they've probably sold two or three million. Yeah. Um, and then, so if you add to that the number of PlayStations that have been sold, PlayStation now number two, right. uh, if you add that, you know, we're into 20 million, you know, consumer users of VR, people yeah. who are buying software, people who are, you know, actively using the platform. Uh, we could argue about what actively is, but people are into this. I mean, it's, it's you know, and then, so segue again, Ultra Leap, which is really an inside baseball kind of company, right? Most yeah. consumers don't need to yeah. know about Ultra Leap. They just raised $82 million Series D. So I got to talk right. to Tom Carter, the founder and CEO uh, about it. And um, I got two interesting insights about Ultra Leap. Uh, one is mm -hmm. they are hand tracking for everybody who is not meta. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in this technology of hand tracking, there are really two sort of players on parallel paths. One is you know, Facebook Reality Labs and the other, the, I wonder if they're keeping that name uh, or if it's just Meta Reality Labs. Yeah, so far I think it's Facebook Reality Labs. I, so anyway, I, not, to, not to digress, but you know, there has to be another way sure. that doesn't belong to Meta. Although I'm sure they'd be happy to license their technology to everybody. Um, but what he described the hand tracking and let's call it sensor mm -hmm. level of VR is the layer between the metaverse and human reality. Mm -hmm. And that was really, so I thought, oh, ding, 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 give this guy $82 million. Right, right, right. Because that was really the right answer and, and I thought very insightful. Yeah, and I think what's, what's happening in the marketplace, and we've seen this with many other sort of technological revolutions as they move to consumer level adoption, is that these layers of technology start to get funded by smart investors that realize there will be a future to all the pieces and parts of an ecosystem that need to make this happen, right? And I think the frothiness of Facebook changing its name defining themselves now as a simulation company, as Meta, the simulation company, um, has started to kind of reinvigorate that investment pool. And they're looking for places where they can see some growth and, and see a target that they can hit. And, you know, we're seeing like the Sandbox VR company get more dollars for LBE and all these other pieces and parts that kind of started strong, went into this little trough, right? That we often call the trough of disillusionment, but now coming out the other side, and if they could survive it long enough, if they could go into cockroach mode, as we say, and just survive the nuclear winter, they're now coming out into the spring. And this is happening across the whole sector. Uh, well, we've got a great guest this morning, Ted. I, yeah. I don't want to delay in introducing him because uh, I think we're going to have a great conversation uh, okay. about Meta. He wrote the book on Meta. Blake Harris, author of History of the Future and before that, Console Wars. Yes. And, and now he's doing all sorts of great stuff. He's a busy man. Let's bring him onto the show. Welcome, Blake. Great to see you this morning and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, I can give you whatever ignorance you need from me. Um, <laughs> so that is good. I, I like you guys, so it's good to uh, be chatting with you. Yeah, you and Ted know each other, right? We do. We've spent time together. I'm a big fan of console wars. Um, and I actually, I, I, I'm going to take this to a slightly divergent path before we go into Blake. Um, <laughs> one of my late night viewing obsessions has been a show called Halt and Catch Fire that was on AMC. Oh, I love that show. And it uh, reminds me. the best show of the, of the uh, geek the, nostalgia, my God, the start of the internet. Yeah. 
it it reminds me a lot of Blake's pursuits and his writings about the sector yeah. and the space. For those of our listeners that don't know it, it's basically a a pseudo fictionalized version of what happened with the stages of the creation of the personal compute revolution into the internet revolution into the um, you know, the, 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 the shareable uh, revolution. And we're in one of those revolutions right now, right? So uh, I think they need to fire up the sequel, which is uh, kind of interesting. Yeah. That's why I want to start. This. Well, thank, thank, that's a huge compliment because it's a huge compliment because that's basically what I always try to do and what that show does so well. It's character-driven storytelling. So whether you yeah. like the internet or yes. just use it or don't care about the history or do, you can follow that story. And it also is, you know, if it's a behind the scenes look, it's something that feels authentic, they do a better job than most things. And uh, that was definitely an inspiration for me. For this I'm glad show. we're all three fans of it. That's actually really good. That we, we just opened up another little bit of fandom for our group yeah, of listeners. It's, I it's, guarantee it's, a lot of them are like, I don't know that show. They're going to sign on and start watching that show. It's, you know, as, I, I also as recommend Blake said, when you know, I watched have, it. Sorry, go ahead, Blake. We, we, we can move on from Halt and Catch Fire, but. I started with season two and I recommend that for anyone because the main character sort of changed. So yeah. I, I think if you skip the first season and then go back, you, you won't be disappointed. That's a good point. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's just, yeah, there's a little slow burn in the first season, but I would definitely recommend for anybody in our industry. It's yeah. a very valuable piece of, of how they created that story and that culture. And anyway. I think it, authentic is the key word there. Yeah. Uh, it just gets so many things right. Mm -hmm. In, including early CEX and Comdex. Yeah, Comdex. So they I go to Comdex, right? It's really interesting. Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, Blake, are you pivoting away from uh, writing fantastic books to making documentaries? Uh, thank you for the compliment, is the question there. Um, not necessarily. If anything, I'm pivoting away from writing fantastic or not books about the tech sector to not do that. My, my next book's about Larry David because uh, I was so uh, saddened and exhausted by the experience of writing about how things went with Facebook or how it went with Oculus and those folks after the acquisition of Facebook. But I, I've, I've always been a filmmaker and so I'm definitely, uh, you know, that's definitely not going to pull me away from writing about tech and other subjects. So you're making a documentary about Larry David or you're writing a book about it or both? Sorry, I'm writing a book about Larry David and I'm just finishing a documentary with my partner, Jonah Tulis about GameStop, about the stock frenzy. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Well, and Larry David, uh, you know, because I live on the west side of LA, uh, uh, for, the, for those that know his show on HBO, Curb Your Enthusiasm, that's sort of pseudo documentary and pseudo fictionalized because it basically just shoots it in all the real places that he lives and hangs out. And every once in a while, I will see him, uh, they'll either shoot the show or just see him like doing the things that are gonna be on the show. For the early seasons, it was like, you'd catch him driving around in his Prius and you're like, oh yeah, that's Larry David. He's going to the coffee shop, he's doing stuff. It's like, it's just real life. Like, it's very interesting that you're- that You're, uh, oh, you're so right. Thing. To reconnect it to what we were talking about with Halt and Catch Fire and maybe what we'll talk about with my work is just, he, it's, even with Seinfeld, which was scripted versus Curb, which is largely improv, even though this, the, the episodes themselves are scripted structurally. It's, it, it's authenticity was so important to him. Even just small things like talking about um, jujubes and using mm -hmm. these, you know, trademark phrases, which people never used on TV before. They would say like Jojo bees. He wanted things, he wanted the conversations and everything to feel and look like the way things are in real life. Right. It would have to be real. Yeah. 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 So something you said, um, made me pause you said you were sorry about the way things turned out with uh, the acquisition of oculus with facebook can you say more about that uh sure i think i said i was saddened and i'm definitely yeah, saddened. Saddened. sorry saddened. Um, well you know like i said with what i liked about halt to catch fire you know i like telling character driven stories and so for me i was very invested in the characters particularly the founders of oculus and the early employees and uh, financially, it went incredibly well for them. No one should cry for them. It's, you know, and they also made their own decision. It yep. was uh, ultimately a unanimous decision or, uh, you know, Michael Antonoff, one of the founders, was more reluctant. But, uh, but I, I think it's just uh, twofold. Part of it is what I was found fascinating about the story was uh, the universal aspect of what happens when any company gets acquired. You know, you inherently are no longer in charge mm -hmm, and right. your mission will change and you don't get to make the final say anymore. Um, 
and that was to be expected, but sort of just uh, the fact that Facebook is essentially a monopoly. Um, and, and as much as I appreciate their continued investment in VR and AR, which I do, um, I really don't like uh, a lot of things about that company and, and what the future of the metaverse will hold with them in charge. If, I mean, yeah. I guess that's not a foregone conclusion they'd be in charge, but I just, the, the way that they've run their other platforms doesn't make me optimistic about how they would run the, you know, their virtual reality platforms. I, I think the way that, see if you agree with this, the way that we tend to describe it, the way that I, when I'm working with all my working cohorts and colleagues about anything related to this is it's a Jekyll and Hyde relationship, right? Is that there are two sides, there are actually multiple sides to a, a multi-trillion dollar valuation company with, you know, 100,000 plus employees all around the world, basically like a small country, right? So you're never going to get it all right. And the goal is to try and get it more right than wrong. Um, and I very much live right in the center of this Jekyll and Hyde phenomenon, where I think in a lot of ways, they do a lot of good for a lot of people to stay connected, especially countries outside of the United States, where they use it to build their economy and, and connect people. But very often, like countries, parts of it can go off the rails, right? And, and go off the rails in really damaging places. And I think the Oculus part of the story mirrors that Jekyll and Hyde sort of phenomenon as well, is when you take a company out of the Kickstarter realm, and then it elevates and elevates to a multi-billion dollar valuation, and then elevates to effectively one of the largest, most exposed companies on the planet. Uh, and the two founders, you know, struggle with that. And I think, you know, one of the two founders really struggled with that publicly. And, and, and at the end of the day, decisions had to be made. But it would be interesting to see your, your perspective on it. You're way deeper than Charlie and I into this in terms of your your, you know, the, the writings that you've done in the creation of the- at, at some point, am I re recalling this correctly? At some point, Facebook decided they weren't too interested in helping you with your book. Uh, yes, I mean, but, and, and after an unprecedented period of access where yeah. they, they, they speak essentially anyone in Oculus and help connect me to people and, uh, and, and, you know, I ended up using thousand documents so that they, they didn't give me the documentation. Uh, systematically lost me about certain things. They, uh, they may be throttling your internet right now. No, something, something's going on there. Like, I'm not sure you. where you are, but. We're losing I, you. I, I, I hope that you can still hear me. Uh, I hope that. Uh, you're back now. Yeah, you're back. Well, here's the thing. If Facebook was throttling my internet, the, there would be no consequences for that because there's never any consequences for anything they do. Uh, that, that's part of what scares me. Um, even with the data, you know, the, uh, VR and AR technology is the most intimate technology of any of these devices of, of hardware we've had in the past. It's, you know, it's so close to your face and your eyes and it's in your home. And even if Facebook says they're not collecting certain data, even if they actually aren't but have the ability to, they put themselves in a position where bad actors can potentially use that information and they take no responsibility for that. You know, like I, I, I think that on balance, exactly. they're not like a quote unquote evil company, but they also are a company that really makes it easy for uh, bad actors to take advantage of them yeah. and in which they're no, they're, they never seem to be accountable or never change their, what they're doing. And so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, three years from now, we learned that, oh, certain data that they said they weren't collecting was collected and was used in certain ways. And then they'll just say, well, we've stopped that. And uh, so that's why I'm, you know, especially with the Jekyll Hyde thing, I'm at, at the one, on the one hand, the Quest and other headsets are the best headsets out there, the best value headsets. But on the other hand, I don't, I'm wary about bringing it into my home and, and, and using it. Right. Are you, are you both familiar with recently Sasha Baron Cohen uh, had a bit of a manifesto that kind of went viral um, when he was talking and he, he really defined the problem well, I think. Blake, have you seen it? Is it, is it anything no, that's touched your radar? Yeah, it's no, a, no. I'll, I'll find the link. It's an easy thing to find. Yeah, that um, sounds really interesting. You've seen it, Charlie? Yeah. It's, I have oh, yeah, not, I it. it sounds really interesting. Send his, that link his, over here. Yeah, his take on it was, was really important and valuable. And, and I, I actually would imagine that the heads of Facebook watched it. And I think they are constantly thinking about this, right? But they have fiduciary responsibility. They have this like, like the, the country of Facebook now meta that they run. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 
Well, I, I think maybe wide berth is, is, is maybe the wrong phrase, but I think uh, myself is I, I try and give them, I try and balance it and I try and find where it makes sense and, and where it doesn't make sense, probably like you do as well, Blake. Yeah, well, we, I think that's pretty accurate. Uh, I would say that the, one of my fundamental problems with Facebook, and again, it's not that they're like quote unquote evil or not, it's a philosophy thing. It's just that I, I, my, my perception after speaking with a lot of executives there, particularly the ones who are still there and have been there since early Facebook, is that they think that they know best and are going to make the decisions and as opposed to listening to their user base and whether that was, you know, early VR adopters that were with Oculus or anything, you know, even just if you go, if you log into like the Facebook on your desktop, the amount of options you have are so limited compared to so many other things. And even just compared to something like a community like Reddit, where it's actually these, it's, it's you know, user driven and user moderated. Facebook wants to moderate everything. And I know that's an apples and oranges comparison, but I think it just speaks to the philosophy of Facebook thinks that they should be making the decisions. And, uh, and, and I wish they would listen to us uh, quite a bit more. Yeah, I'm just not sure that anybody should uh, be in a position of this much power over uh, not just our society, but other societies, because people like it's free software. And he, he's, again, accountability is, is I think, a big theme here. And the other thing is, look, they started with this go fast and break things. So they are heedless of unintended consequences. And as you point out, when those un, unintended consequences manifest themselves, they're like, well, what? Us? We didn't do anything. <laughs> and so- I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, that um, that's a concern, right? I mean, that there will be unintended consequences, whether we predict them or not, bad actors seem to always find new unintended consequences because humans. So, uh, you know, that's why these things need rules because humans, including Mark Zuckerberg, who I admire, probably more than three quarters of the people that I've ever heard of, but still that one person should not have that kind of power. Okay, he's kind of benevolent right now, but 10 years from now, look, the guy lives in a bubble. He's cut off from regular humanity. So it's possible he could lose all empathy. It's all sorts of things are still possible. He's a young guy and he is unlike us, regular people, um, there are no rules that apply to him. And yeah. so if he made a mistake and we could argue whether he's been making mistakes or you know, whether it's, it's his country and you know, the way he manages it or, or whatever, you know, mistakes have been made because the guy is human and the people who work at that company are human. They've made some reprehensible decisions, but accountability is the thing. If there are no rules, and anybody can do anything, then you end up with a society full of disinformation and potential violence as people tribalize and um, you know um, uh, demonize the other that is somehow ruining it for them. And you know, Facebook or a government Facebook has not gotten a hold of their arms around that. Yeah. Because it should be honestly controlled by the government or somebody who has authority over them, you know, who can sanction them, you know, and those people should be elected by us and accountable to us, right? We, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has 60% of Facebook's voting stock, you know, so he's, there's nobody on his board, unlike Google. There is no board of directors to say, this Oculus thing is crazy, $10 billion a year for the metaverse. Are you out of your freaking <laughs> mind? That is the shareholder's money. Well, let's let's dive into that because I think that's interesting. I, mean, I think we could rail on Facebook just like the world can rail on Facebook all day long, but I think it's more productive to talk about, okay, you just mentioned $10 billion you know, as a, as a write-off in their company's profit, committed not over like a 10 or 15 year period, which would kind of like, oh, $10 billion. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> They're literally talking about spending this money over the course of a calendar year, right? Um, yeah. So, I mean, Blake, you've got to have some opinions on this, right? What, <laughs> what, what do you think is going to happen? Again, talk about this, this like the, the effect of a GDP applied to a, a goal set. How messy is that going to be? How interesting is it going to be? What do you think is going to come out of Ten billion dollars, and, and where's it all going to land? Right? You, you got, you got to have some opinions on that. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's to me, that's like the core of the Jekyll and Hyde aspect where it's like, ah, I don't really like these guys, but I love that they're investing all this money in this technology that I love. Okay. Um, <laughs> how, can, how can they do all this great stuff without them ending up with so much control? Um, yeah, I mean, that was always the part that I found so admirable about what they were doing, that they were willing to do this even with no short-term profits. And certainly that has proven to be the case. And I know that's a big part of, even today, if you were to ask the founders of Oculus, I'm sure that even if you ask Palmer, who, uh, uh, who's, who left not by choice, he probably would still do the deal again, just because of he cared so much about VR as a, as a technology and as a community and felt that this was what would give it the best chance to succeed. And um, I think he would say he probably was not wrong about that. Yes. Yeah, I think without without a hero who's willing to bear the losses over seven years, right, to get to this point, I, I just don't see how it would have happened for consumers. I think it would be uh, out there with, you know, things like the HoloLens, you know, inside of big companies that could afford to pay a premium for uh, a slightly better way of doing things. Um, but instead, we have, you know, 20 million consumer headsets in the wild, uh, probably about three quarters of them made by Meta. Right. So I think that without them, I just don't know. I mean, you know, it would, maybe, it would be a much longer... would have been helped by Sony or somebody else. I mean, it, you know, it's hard to game it out. But, you know, Facebook was an absolute home run for VR. And, and they still are. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, Blake, was, you know, this keynote that really was like a movie that starred Mark Zuckerberg. I, I mean, I thought it was both thrilling and terrifying at the same time. I think everybody really had that reaction, like, yeah, that could happen, but some of it is like, I mean, there was a lot of the whale jumping through the floor that uh, Magic Leap was pilloried for, except it was 70 <laughs> minutes of that. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I was not kidding when I said I've really been away from the space. Uh, we were really we we're finishing up post-production on that film. So I, I haven't seen it and I've heard about it, but why don't you tell me what was in that video? Uh, and I'm, I guess probably all of your listeners have, have seen it. It's funny that of all people but, uh, you haven't seen it yet, which is interesting, which is actually a good tenant of the fact that the world is much larger than right. just one event or one I moment. Well, time. I once had an editor at Forbes say to me, you don't understand what you cover from our point of view is the nichiest of the niche. <laughs> the tiniest little thing. Right. Yeah. It's not as big as crypto. It's <laughs> not as big as East. Well, it's also yeah, that that is true to some degree, though there is an aspect to like it, it this is maybe a bad analogy, but sometimes I I, I, I love sports, but I like I like watching games where I root for someone, usually the underdog. And when it's like two evenly matched teams, I'm not as interested. And so basically me wanting to root for something seems important to my uh, desire to consume content. And I don't know what to root for when I see Mark, because I love what they do for VR, but I really dislike him and, and the potential. So, so I, I sort of also chose not to watch it. I mean, um, I, I will watch it, but but I made it not a priority because I am so conflicted about Facebook. Or, well, or I mean, again, I think it was a, a, you know, he was really talking to shareholders and trying to explain what he was spending $10 billion a year on. Mm -hmm. And I think it probably was effective for that. Um, for everybody who's kind of following Facebook or uh, has worked with them or is working with them or is using their product, I think it was profound in that their influence is profound. So if they say this is what we're talking about, then we talk about it, right? That's the whole metaverse conversation right now, right? Because the three of us have been talking about the metaverse for decades. Right, exactly. Right. So it's sort of like, oh, you all want to talk about the metaverse now? Well, okay. <laughs> but well, they only want to talk about put... it because one of the biggest companies in the world wants to talk about it. Yeah, I think if you put a, 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 a kind of a wider lens that the three of us can do with, with this as it relates to the pipe of the internet and these gigantic public companies now that have capitalized on the pipe, right? And figured out how to fully utilize it, benefit from it, grow their companies to mass evaluations, have huge employee counts and huge resources. So all of those companies 
have a deep requirement, whether they realized it overtly or it just happened kind of organically in the process, that they have to constantly be reinventing and modernizing themselves, right? And I think Apple is probably the best sort of shining star example of a company, you know, through the, the days in the life of Steve Jobs, who understand that as his DNA, understood they have to constantly release new products that build upon the old tenants of what they did and find new ways for people to connect with these devices use them for productivity and socialization, et cetera, et cetera, right? Facebook is no different. Google is no different. Microsoft is no different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all the other companies, you know, HP and, all, and, and Qualcomm and, and all the different chip manufacturers and Sony and Samsung, they're all effectively the same thing now, right? They all have to find new things to either acquire or cultivate to demonstrate to their stockholders and the world and their, of their users that they're constantly modernizing and changing. So for all of what we could critique Mark Zuckerberg and his executive team, when they decide to pick up Instagram, when they decide to pick up WhatsApp, there are very tactical reasons to do that. When they decide to pick up Oculus, there's a very tactical reason no, they, to do that. They have made uh, you know, great strategic corporate decisions. I mean, had they not acquired Instagram, Instagram might be bigger than Facebook right now. Correct, right. Right. And, and look at Snap as, a, as an interesting example of the one that, you know, was contrarian and decided not to go down that road, right? Yeah. They're still doing okay, but think about the alternative universe if they had decided that they would yeah. bring that world in. And, you know, what Facebook did is, well, if we can't have you, we'll just build our own version because it's not that hard to take all these products and services and duplicate them because of the power and technology and the internet, right? So you lock it all together. I mean, this is like what you write about, Blake, what, what your, your whole thesis is about these kind of things, right? When you go back to what, what, now what I call a classic of console wars. And if any of our listeners haven't read it, <laughs> put it on your reading list or listening list on Audible because it's a fantastic story. And it really is a drama, right? Of why, what, what happens with all these companies. It's sort of a smaller version of what is constantly happening and what just has happened with these large tech companies now. It's just in the days of console wars, you had companies that had valuations at like one one hundredth of where these, these tech companies sit today, right? Yeah, and, and another big difference that I think, and this might also be a dumb analogy, but I, you know, I always thought about, comp about competition and business and capitalism as like, you know, if there's a pizza shop and you think you can make a better pizza, then you start your business. And if you have a better pizza, people will come to you. And that's no longer the case anymore with the internet, because if you make a better pizza, even like Snap, the Facebook pizza place will just clone it at no cost to them, essentially. Okay. And they have 10x, 100x the number of users or like the resources to implement it. And that that's, always, I mean, scary to me, but that's just the way it is. So. Uh, it just is what it is. And there, and there are pieces that they miss, right? They're like, like could yeah. they have been Roblox? Absolutely, Facebook could have been Roblox. But Roblox had an interesting DNA core that built organically, and they were not watching that space close enough. They were certainly doing light touch gaming within the Facebook interface and mobile gaming and all that stuff. But Roblox found a different DNA, right? Um, and, and now look at their valuation, right? Uh, well, and I mean, they, they grabbed on to, to one of the um, secret powerhouses of the internet, which has always been user-generated content. Mm -hmm. And really what does Facebook and Twitter, uh, you know, do, but, but organize user-generated content? Yeah. Really good point. So we're, we're almost I, out I of time. For you guys. Well, well I, I need to get my question because you guys, like you said, we've been talking about this for decades. You, saw, you guys more so than me. And you also have such a unique vantage point. I, 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 had a, I had a conversation like when I first started my book, so five years ago with the VC. And as we've talked about, this is a revolution. We're in the midst of revolution. And there's a comparison to like the dot-com revolution of the 90s. And I asked him early on if he thought that this was going to like, who would be the next Google or Facebook to emerge from this VR, AR revolution? And he said that he felt, unfortunately, that this was going to be uh, a, a, a situation where the winners get, you know, the 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 companies that the, the the rich get richer, um, yeah. so that there wouldn't be like the new startups that grow to become the next Facebook. And I was curious if you guys thought that was true, especially with, like the vision that Mark laid out. I, I do think that's true, but I think you need to take into account today the power of foreign countries and what's going on 
in those foreign countries. So if you ask me where the next Google is going to come out of, I would honestly say to you, China, because if it came out in the United States, it would get purchased at some price. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess my, my perspective on it is largely correct, but I'm also of the belief that there are always these new young startups that figure out something new and can build and create so quickly that they actually will not be uh, an, an acquisition target. Roblox is probably a good example of that, right? Yeah. That they, they lock into something, they lock into a cultural moment, just like you know, Apple did, Facebook did, Google did at its time. And you know, look at all the, all, the, all the also rands that didn't quite get there or really kind of no longer relevant, like even Yahoo, and AOL, all those yep. things. This goes back to our halt and catch fire sort of discussion, right? Yeah. Um, so there's always something new around the next corner. I mean, that's well, ultimately how I how I, I think stay that's one of, one of the job. things that I love about covering this story, right? There's all sorts of things that happen that you just couldn't predict them. Yeah. And then so, I guess the, the, the non-sad or scary answer to my that analogy of the competitive pizza place is that if you do make a good pizza, you probably will attract a good community and maybe you won't be as big as the other guy, but maybe one day you will be if you keep catering to that specific clientele and doing your thing and that no amount of cloning is going to take away that authentic um, you know, maybe, uh, community that you're building. Right. And Blake, so before we wrap up, just before we wrap up, um, because we, we talk a lot about different parts of the world, but just to give our listeners a little take of where do they find your stuff? What are the things you want them to check out from you? Just exactly. give us a little minute or so to just yeah. because we talked about lots of different things that weren't about you right now. So let's let's just talk oh, about sure. you for a oh, moment. Thank you. So I basically spent the past decade of my life writing two different books, like about five years on each one, Council Wars, one the history of the future. As Ted mentioned, the Council Wars is a story about uh, Sega versus Nintendo in the 90s. It's uh, you know, a, a different sort of corporate battle. Uh, to me, it was always sort of like Mad Men, but with joysticks. And then the history of the future was a much as a modern story. The, the founding of Oculus, the acquisition by Facebook, and you know, the big battle in that story was not you know company versus company. It was really kind of the status quo versus a world that thought virtual reality was silly or had failed already or was the next you know it was just flying cars. It was this thought to be futuristic technology that failed um and it's, and it's so fascinating for that reason because it's a group of true believers trying to convince the world that this thing is inevitably going to happen or needs to happen or should happen um and you can find the stuff uh, you know uh on any at any bookstore at amazon barnes and noble barnes and noble.com um and uh yeah I, the, I i love my job because it's been an honor to tell these people stories uh even if i disagree with a lot of things that mark zuckerberg does or people at Sega or Nintendo, uh, I do really respect them a great deal. Yes. And so them opening up and getting to, letting me, letting me write their stories has been awesome. So I think that, uh, I, I think very highly of the books and they're great stories, but that's also just a chance to meet these really interesting men and women that uh, are much more interesting than me. Yeah, I, I, I second that. And uh, the Thanks. books are, are monumental in scale and exacting in detail and written like novels. I love that about them. We, as I told you, I just uh, assigned uh, my VR class at Chapman University. Uh, I made them read uh, History of the Future. And, and a lot of them were like, I, I read that thing in two sittings. <laughs> it's like a 600 page book. Yeah, it's, it's juicy, kind of pulpy, history. right? Pulpy yeah. stuff. And it feels so good. My, my goal was always, I wanted to write uh, books as dense as Disney War and that read, but that read like the Da Vinci Code. So. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I think you hit it out of the park, my friend. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, Blake. We enjoyed it. Great to see you guys. You too. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye.